Hello and welcome back to Drive Driver Driven. I'm Humble and today we're gonna to talk about wiring and sensors and hopefully make a little bit of sense out of a lot of chaos and uh, try to make this easier on those who are maybe intimidated or, or uh, put out by wiring projects. So the goal is to try and simplify that as much as possible. So let me flip the camera around and we'll get to it. If a site like this puts you into shock and paralyzation and you don't know where to start or what to do, let me break it down as simply as I can. It, there, there's really not much to it. It's just tackling one thing at a time. And then once you understand how each of these systems and sensors work, uh, it really is just knocking it out little by little. Over here on the workbench, um, I've done a few drawings and I've got a few examples of the sort of sensors and outputs that you'll find on a, a typical EFI installation. Uh, so generally every uh, fuel injection system, ECU, whatever, will run some combination of these type of inputs and outputs. So let's start with our inputs. Input wise, you're gonna need uh, a crank signal and a cam signal. And that's gonna come through uh, one of two types of sensors typically. So you'll have a VR or a variable reluctor, uh, which gives a simple sort of sine wave output and a Hall effect sensor. And this will give a uh, cleaner kind of square wave, but there's reasons why you'll run one sensor versus another. A VR sensor is usually identified because uh, it's got two pins, and these are typically used in higher temperature or higher vibration uh, areas. So this is like, you know, sensors that are directly mounted to the engine typically. Uh, so your crank and cam sensors are usually going to be a VR sensor. The, the reason this is, let's say, bad or different is because this sine wave, every time a tooth passes the sensor, it generates this sort of sine wave. And the slower that tooth passes, the lower the difference is between these peaks and troughs. So if the tooth is not moving very fast, let's say when you're cranking the engine over, uh, this wave will look compressed. It'll be smaller because there's less voltage. But on the flip side is the faster that tooth is passing, the higher the peaks and the lower the troughs. And what that amounts to is higher voltage and a lower negative voltage between peaks. So as your crank or cam or whatever is spinning faster and faster, uh, you're generating more and more voltage and usually you have to have some kind of a filter applied. Otherwise, it is possible to cook an input circuit by running it too high or, or too fast with these type of VR sensors. On the flip side, you have these Hall Effect sensors which give a nice clean square wave. Um, it'll always have the same voltage output. When you're using a Hall Effect sensor like this, they tend to be fairly sensitive to the distance between the end of the sensor and the pickup or you know, the tooth. So if it's farther away, it may not trigger. And if it's too close, it might actually hit, uh, you know, hit the tooth. And whereas the variable reluctor can be uh, somewhat tolerant of a toothed wheel that is out of round, um, a Hall Effect sensor will just miss teeth in that regard. So this is good for like drivetrain sensors, for uh, wheel speed sensors. That's typically where you'll see these. The Hall Effect sensors tend to be sensitive to heat. And I've actually burned through uh, a few of these on the Ultima because they just don't tolerate high heat environments. The Big difference in wiring is, so our VR sensor, as I said, is a two pin. So 
You'll see it as a signal and a ground wire. They go back to your ECU. On your Hall Effect sensor, these are typically five volts, although some of these can also be 12 volts. And you'll have uh, an input voltage, a signal output, and then a ground. And the signal is what you're seeing here is this is what it will be output on that kind of signal wire. So we have our crank cam or speed sensors all run one of these, either a VR or a Hall effect sensor. So we know our RPM of the motor or our cam or our drivetrain. Now we have a resistance sensor. Resistance sensors are gonna be like your fuel level sender or your temperature sensors, something like that. They'll either be a one wire and the sensor will ground through the block, like an engine block, or it'll be two wire. And again, it'll either be a temperature sensor for the engine or intake, or uh, to supply its own ground, or uh, something like our, our fuel level, again, which we're supplying a ground because it may or may not be going to a grounded tank. So uh, typically, if the sensor is going to be in a, an environment that isn't grounded or in a plastic intake or a plastic fuel tank, uh, you'll typically see a ground supplied along with your uh, sensor wire. You'll either have one wire going out and then a grounding to the block or two wires going to your temperature sensor. One is ground, one is your uh, your power feed or whatever that's, that's going to pick up on the resistance. And uh, the way these work is your resistance changes with temperature. Or in the case of our fuel level, as the float moves up and down, it changes the resistance uh, that's being uh, picked up by our leads. So uh, we call those uh, like a resistance sensor. Uh, pretty easy to figure out, pretty easy to wire. They aren't usually polarized, but in the, uh, the instance of like a fuel sender, usually the ground will go to the housing and it'll have a separate uh, pin or tab uh, that your uh, other sensor wire will plug into. Uh, next up is our reference sensors. A uh, reference sensor is gonna be things like our throttle position or a pressure sensor. What we mean by reference is we need to know a little more detail about the thing we're measuring and uh, uh, we're gonna reference a ground or reference a voltage and get feedback on a position or a temperature based on those references. So typically these are wired with a five volt, a signal and a ground wire coming out. Uh, so your throttle position sensor, you feed five volts in, and depending on the position of your butterflies, uh, you'll have a variable signal coming out, uh, usually between zero and 4.5 volts, that tell you what position your throttle is in. Uh, for pressure, same thing, uh, your you know, 0.5 volts might be no pressure, and your 4.5 volts might be 150 pounds of pressure. Uh, and then there's gonna be a little bit of voltage for every step in between. As an example, here we have our intake air temperature sensor. Um, this one has a brass body and two connectors. So this one will take our signal wire and our ground um, you can plug them in either way, it doesn't matter, it's not polarized. And this is just a very simple sensor, that's all there is. There's a little thermistor bulb that changes the resistance uh, that comes across these wires, and that's what we're measuring. Uh, this is an example, if you can see it in there, of our uh, manifold air pressure. So this is again a reference sensor with three wires, so we have a five volt a ground and our signal wire. And again, this is just like our other pressure sensors, gonna have a variable signal based on what kind of uh, pressure or a lack of pressure that it's seeing. So in this case, we're looking for ambient pressure or a slight vacuum, which is gonna be between uh, zero bar and one bar. That's pretty much it for all of our our basic inputs with 
uh, these four inputs, that's all you need for an engine. And if you break it down, that's, that's all there is. So if we look back at the engine, we can see that we have a temp sensor here. Uh, we have another temp sensor, but this is a special case because this is a temp and pressure sensor combined. It's using four wires. So two of those are gonna be a ground and for our temperature sensor. And then we're using that same common ground, a five volt and our a signal wire that's separate for our pressure side. Uh, looking at our cam sensors here, these are again uh, a three wire. So this is like a Hall effect sensor on the back of the engine here. Uh, but on the front, which you can't really see down there, our crank sensor is actually a VR type sensor. So just a couple of examples of uh, what we've just poked through and you know how to identify it and where you might see them. And again, once you wire this, you can move on to the next thing. It's really simple once you start breaking it down. So now that we have our, our inputs, we need our outputs. We need something to drive all the devices on the engine. So that's gonna be our injectors, our coils, cam control if we have it. This is like VTEC uh, for a high or low lobe on the cam or a cam timing solenoid. Uh, this is for modern engines that have cam timing control to advance or retard cam timing. And then lastly, uh, relays that would drive our fans or fuel pump or other devices. So starting with our injectors, injectors are just two wires, a 12 volt and a signal. The signal is technically a ground, but it's a ground that is driven by the ECU. So it's always got 12 volts going to it and then the ECU will close the ground contact and that causes the injector to fire. Like the other devices, polarity doesn't matter. It's just driving, again, like a solenoid, super easy to wire. Our coils uh, are a little bit more involved and there's a couple different kinds of coils. Most installations these days will have what's called a smart coil, which are usually three or four wires. And uh, for a three wire coil, you'll have a 12 volt, a ground, and your signal, which is to fire the coil. Uh, but there might also be like a uh, feedback off of the field, uh, which would be the fourth wire for a smart coil. Or if you're not running a coil on plug and you have a uh, shared coil like a Miata or other uh, older cars will have a kind of a, it's like two coils in one. You'll have a 12 volt, a ground, and then signal wires to fire a coil one and then coil two. So this one you'll have to be a little more careful about because you want to make sure you get all of the wires in the correct location. And for all of these sensors, you can find all this stuff online looking up the bespoke coils or sensors that you're using. It's a lot easier now than it used to be. For your cam control, again, this is VTEC. It's like a switch, so it's on or off. Uh, you typically have a 12 volt and a ground wire. So when you wanna get on the high cam, you just send it 12 volts, we're on the high cam. If you wanna go back to the low side, you turn it off whenever you need to cross that VTEC barrier or what have you. Um, that's how the, the VTEC solenoid works to turn it on and off. Uh, for cam timing, that's a little bit different. So it's also a solenoid, uh, it's two wire, it's 12 volts, but it's variable. And the way this works is, you'll send a, a variable amount of voltage to rotate the cam or control its position uh, very carefully. And again, we're gonna use feedback from our cam timing sensor to figure out how much the cam has advanced or retarded uh, by using that solenoid. Um, again, it's 12 volt, it's two wire, and you can't really screw it up, it, you know, it'll, uh, go together one way. Uh, these might actually be polarized. I would have to double check, but it also depends on what sort of system you're using. If it's Ford, if it's Honda, uh, Toyota, etc. 
um, you'll have to find that information online or in manuals. Um, and then lastly, our relay setup. Relays confuse a lot of people, but once you break it down, it is a fairly simple system. I have a couple of examples here. So this is like a typical relay that you'll see. Uh, just a basic four pin, nothing doing. But then I also have a micro relay. And you'll see more and more of these uh, in newer cars. Uh, the, the function is basically the same. So this will be getting a low amperage 12 volt signal from the ECU. And that'll flip an internal switch, which then drives a high amperage 12 volt signal out of the relay. You can't drive the fan or fuel pumps with uh, most ECUs. Uh, it's just too much of a high current load and it could damage the ECU potentially. So you'll use a, something like a, a relay, which protects the ECU and enables a higher amperage uh, driver that you can still use these devices and power them. So you'll have uh, all of the terminals will have numbers like 30, 87, 86, 85. Uh, sometimes, depending on the relay, if it's like f meant for headlights, you'll see an 87A and an 87B. That's kind of why I've drawn it in a uh, dotted line here. From your battery or a fused uh, battery 12 volt circuit, you'll have, uh, that'll go to main 30. Your ground, because these relays need to be grounded, will go to 85. And then your ECU will go to terminal 86. Uh, this is what closes the internal switch on the relay. So your ECU supplies 12 volts, which then goes to ground via 85 here. And that closes a contact inside the relay, which then closes the gap between 30 and 87. And then now whatever circuit this is driving, if it's a fan or a pump, that circuit now gets power. And then when we want to stop, we turn off our 86 input in the ECU, which then opens the contact here. It opens the contact here and it disables or turns off our fan and pump. In a headlight circuit, you'll have main 12 volts in and uh, if you have an 87A and an 87B, uh, whenever this main 12 gets power, the 87A will also get power. So that will be your low beam. So if you turn on your headlights, this will automatically go to our low beams and our low beams will be on. And then you hit the bright switch on your steering wheel stock or what have you, which would go down to 86. So then that closes, that powers our, our switch down here. And then it would switch from 87A to 87B. And then we would go from our low beams to our high beams. And that's how your typical uh, headlight relay would work. Just a simple design, uh, very easy way to uh, protect a lower amperage circuit to drive higher amperage devices. Once you know how it's wired and how it works, um, it makes a lot of sense and it kind of takes the mystery and the difficulty out of wiring these up. So I know we're getting a little long, but uh, lastly, I wanted to show just some of the tools that I use when I'm um, installing, troubleshooting, or working with the various devices. Um, first off is a power supply. Um, this is sort of a, a custom unit that uh, Sean printed out for me. It uses a little power supply circuit uh, that just plugs in the front. This is a 3D printed body. It's got our outputs in the back here. And then it just takes one of my Ryobi batteries. What's nice is from the Ryobi battery, I can set the voltage in this power supply so I can drive 12 volts, 5 volts, 14 volts, whatever and I can test the various sensors and circuit using this guy. Um, there are other benchtop units that are much nicer. I just like this is because it's uh, battery driven and portable. I'm not gonna be able to dry high amperage stuff with it, but it's got enough juice for like headlights or a stereo or something like that if I wanna test it and make sure it works. So it's just really handy that I can drag this over to the car 
uh, and use it. There are bench tops units that are a little bit nicer, but power supplies in general are a lot cheaper than they used to be. A uh, voltometer or voltmeter. One of the, you'll want a nicer one, I'll say. It doesn't have to be super expensive, but you want to be able to measure resistances. Uh, some of these will also have thermocouples for temperature. Uh, you'll want continuity and uh, continuity usually with a noise or a beeper so that if uh, you're touching the same wire end to end uh, using the probes, you'll hear a noise. It's good for tracing out circuits, uh, especially on big wiring projects. So you'll need to pick up one of these. A nice to have, it's not a need to have, but once you have one, you'll never go back. And this is called a power probe. So uh, using this device, you'll actually hook this up to your car battery and you can supply uh, power using the tip or you can supply a ground. This will tell you if a circuit is hot, uh, you can power it and then see if the device is working or not. Uh, there's a lot of troubleshooting steps you can make with this guy while you're next to a device and it comes in really handy when you're trying to figure out if something's working or not. I also have a set of like crimpers and strippers here that I like to use. I, I just picked these up recently, just um, uh, Nipix wire strippers. Uh, I can't believe I haven't used uh, something like this. Uh, typically, I would use this guy, which is uh, honestly my favorite set of just manual hand strippers in different sizes. These have always been sharp. They've worked really well. It's just a little more involved and this guy is just kind of a quick and easy one done. A pair of cutters, you're gonna need these different sizes, different jobs. And then we come into our crimpers. So this, if I can zoom in here, is for uh, uh, kind of a, a crush style crimper. It's kind of hard to, to see, but it'll work for these guys. And it just folds those little ends around the wire and around the insulation for a nice positive lock. And it's got uh, different sizes for all the different shapes from 14 gauge down to like 22 gauge or something like that. Uh, and then lastly, because I, I'm working with Deutsche connectors, I have uh, various sizes in these uh, Deutsche pin uh, crimpers. And again, I don't know if you can see in there, there's just concentric teeth that pinch down on the barrel to pinch that wire in place. And uh, you, these are very specific to size. So uh, depending on the size of pin, you'll, you'll need one or multiple of these style, or you'll need a, a crimper with uh, removable or changeable dies. So I know that's a lot and this is gonna be kind of long, but I wanted to cover as many bases as I could to try and simplify each of the various sensors or outputs that you'll see in any EFI install. And once you know how they work, it makes wiring it significantly simpler. And um, as I've said many times so far, with the Haltech setup, even setting up the software to use these various sensors is fairly easy. If you're thinking about tackling something like this uh, for the first time, I'll actually recommend using a Haltech ECU to start with, just because they do a lot to simplify this process and make it really, really easy for the end user. That being said, I think I'm gonna wrap up this episode. If you have any questions or if you want me to dial down a little bit further on anything, or if there's something I haven't covered, uh, leave me a comment down below and I'll bring it up in a future video because we still have some more wiring to tackle on this car and now's a good opportunity to go through it. So thank you guys for watching and I'll see you next time.